Ladies and gentlemen, I have here tonight some bad news. The world is getting warmer, and it's mostly your fault. Now, I bet most of you sitting here tonight care about global warming, want to see things get better and not worse. But the fact is, everything that the research tells us about our individual carbon footprints is that they're really only based on a very few things and few decisions that we make over the course of our entire life. It's the car we drive, it's where we live, where we work, and very critically, the level of wealth and income of the country that we live in. What that means for pretty much every American, and I would wager especially those of you sitting here tonight, you have made the planet a lot worse than most of the other 8 billion people living in this world. Now, I also have some good news. If we do end up living in a hotter world, it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be a world any of us should want to live in, but you will all probably be okay. And that's because another thing the research tells us is that the more resources you have, the better off the country that you live in, um, the more developed the place that you live in is, the more you're able to respond to the changes in climate, the more you're able to adapt to all the negative effects that we're going to see if we do end up living in a hotter world. Now, I'm here to talk about this tonight because not only is it a major issue in thinking about things like income inequality, but it's also a major obstacle in our entire ability as a human race to build the things that we need to fight climate change, to build the infrastructure that we need to make sure that we don't live in a much hotter world that's two or three or four degrees centigrade above where we're living now. So I think we have a solution to this problem, which I'm going to talk about later. But right now, I'm just going to highlight what I'm talking about here and this disparity of outcomes and, and the effects of global warming. Uh, this is a map of the world. Um, the redder areas and the redder countries are what the UN's Human Development Index has indicated as lower levels of development. The greener countries are higher levels of development. And what you notice here is there's a big concentration of underdeveloped countries in the equatorial zones, in the areas, in the hotter areas of the world around the equator, whereas the global north is a lot richer. It's uh, the United States and Europe and China and Russia. Now, we know that if the planet does get a lot warmer, it's going to be bad everywhere. Nobody here is going to get out of this um, with any kind of benefit. But we also know that the things that are very, very closely associated with the changing climate like floods, like droughts, like heat waves, tropical cyclones, mosquito-borne illnesses. These are going to be a lot more frequent in these equatorial zones than they are in the global north. When the UN counts the number of deaths directly attributable to climate change, about 99% of them happen in developing countries, most of which are located in the global south. Now, this is, of course, kind of ironic because the biggest polluters, the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases are all us living up here in the north, in the United States, in China, and in Europe. So we are the most responsible for this warming world, yet we are better able to deal with the consequences of climate change than a lot of the other people who are not doing so much to harm the planet. Now, what do we, uh, but you know, this happens here in the United States as well. Uh, just think about the California wildfires for a second. This was, you know, just some images here reminding us of how truly devastating this was uh, and continues to be. This is a problem that we know is connected to climate change. We know these fires are here to stay for the time being and probably only getting worse over coming decades. It's going to be a chronic thing. Really, everybody who is living in the American West is going to deal with. And, you know, we've seen millions of acres burned and, and, and millions of towns or uh, thousands of towns burned down to the ground. And, you know, the same thing happens, though, here. We see uh, the rich are much, able, much better able to cope with these kinds of natural disasters than the poor. The wealthy can buy things like air purifiers, which cost several hundred dollars. They only work in one room. They're very expensive to run. They can do things like buy backup power generators for their homes. A lot of times these uh, wildfires will knock out power in the areas that they happen, and People be without power, but if you can afford it, you can still cool and heat your home. Real estate values in the areas that aren't affected by the fires have gone through the roof. If you can afford to buy a new place or rent a new place in the areas while the fires are going on, then you, you pretty much do. Whereas if you can't do all that stuff, you're stuck 
living and working and going to school in areas with air quality indices that are as bad as any city in the world. So again, I bring this up because when it comes to making the investments that we need to fight climate change, all the uh, renewable energy that we need to put onto the grid, the situation here is exactly flipped. The benefits of making those investments flow to the rich and the, uh, in, to a much higher degree than they do to the poor and those with less and less resources. You know, one of the most frustrating, thi frust one of the most frustrating things about working on the issue of climate change, which is something I do every day, is that we know the answer. We know how to do this. We know how to fix this problem. We have all the technology we need right now to solve climate change. The problem is we're just not doing it fast enough and we're not switching from fossil fuels to renewable energy resources like wind, solar, nuclear power uh, as fast as we need to. And probably the biggest reason is we haven't figured out a good way to pay for it. This stuff is really expensive. Uh, we need trillions of dollars of investment, trillions with a T. And to do that kind of investment, you really are limited in what kind of entity can do it. You can either be a large sovereign nation or a large multinational energy company. And the benefits of those investments flow to the shareholders. They don't flow to the people whose livelihoods and, and health are at greatest risk from a changing climate. Uh, I'm going to talk about high voltage transmission for a second, which you might not know a lot about, but if you are in the energy industry, you know that if we are going to tackle climate change, we need thousands and thousands of more miles of this stuff everywhere in the United States and around the world. These big, big wires are a great way to take energy from where it's generated uh, to where it's needed. And if we're going to make renewables work on the energy grid, we need a lot more of this stuff. The problem is it's really, really hard to build, not just because it's expensive, but it's very, very hard to get it permitted, to get it uh, approved to uh, the, the, the right of way to send power from where it's generated to where it's needed. And it's not hard to see why. If you're trying to build a, a power line from one part of the United States to another, you got to get permission from every single state that's between the starting and the end points of that line. We see this happening in New England. For years, there have been all these ideas to use high voltage transmission to bring cheap, renewable Canadian hydroelectric power down to the lower load centers of, of uh, Connecticut, lower New England, New York, and Rhode Island and Massachusetts. But these things keep getting delayed, they keep getting held up, and it's mostly because of Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. And now nothing against those states whatsoever. I love New Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. But you can easily see why there's all this grassroots political resistance against building these lines. If I'm sitting there in New Hampshire, why would I want uh, to see my pristine backyard torn up for a huge high voltage transmission tower to take power from Canada, of all places, and give it somebody in to somebody in Massachusetts where I don't live. This is what leads to nimbyism, not in my backyard, something you may have heard of. This is a huge problem when it comes to building renewable energy infrastructure. There's a lot of nimbyism both here in the United States and the rest of the world. And again, this I think comes down to the fact that the people who are at greatest risk to the harmful effects of climate change can't participate in these investments. And, I'm, and I mean financially here. They don't get the money that these investments generate when they generate returns. People don't build this stuff for free. They build it because they get paid to. But the money that they make from these investments, which by the way, is a very safe, very stable amount of cash. All of us buy energy every day, whether we're putting gas in our car or we're paying for our utility electric bills. And that's something investors love. They love safe, stable cash flows. But the problem is when we need to make investments to stave off the worst effects of climate change, we don't allow those of us with less resources and those of us who are poor to participate in those investments. So what is my solution here? Uh, very, very simple. We need to make it easier for this to happen. We need to give skin in the game to those of us who have the greatest risk to our health and livelihood from climate change, we need to make it easier for them 
to participate in the financial rewards of infrastructure investment. And we know we can do this because it's happening already in a few small areas of the country. This is a picture of a transmission line that's located in California within the tribal area of uh, the Morongo Native American tribe. What this uh, Native American tribe did, this very unique thing, a developer wanted to build this high voltage transmission line through their, their tribal areas. And you know, normally this would be a classic setup for a grassroots political resistance where uh, the local people who wouldn't see any real economic benefit from the line would resist its construction. But what they did here is they created a structure where the tribe itself actually owns capacity in that line. Now that ownership of that capacity generates a financial return every year for as long as the line's in operation. Uh, millions and millions of dollars we're talking about, and that all fl flows right into the tribal government. Now the tribal government can use that money to do whatever it wants. It can build schools, it can fund anti-poverty programs, energy access. It's um, a really you know, powerful amount of money for uh, this group of people out there in California. And you know, think about what this does to flip somebody's attitude around. They have changed nimbyism to yimbyism. Yes, in my backyard. They have taken people who would otherwise be opposed to the project and made them say, hey, you know what? We want this to get built. We are invested in its success. We want, when it's built, we don't want it to fall down. We want to take care of it and make sure it operates well. And my own company did a similar thing out in California. We, that, that's a picture of the largest low-income community solar project in the country. It's about 40 megawatts. And that was constructed with funds used in a similar structure to the Morongos that we created an ownership structure where we own a portion of capacity in a high voltage transmission line that runs through the Imperial Valley in California. The Imperial Valley is one of the poorest areas of California, very, very high rates of unemployment, very, very high rates of poverty. And what we did in constructing this solar array is we used the funds that were generated from that transmission line to provide every low income subscriber in the Imperial Valley with a discount on their, on their utility bills. It's about $500 a year goes to about 12,000 people every year for the next 20 years. Uh, one of those people is Lupita Castro. That's a picture of her right there. She's a single mom. She lives and works in the Imperial Valley. Uh, ask a person like Lupita Castro how she feels about high voltage transmission development. And you're going to get a very different answer than somebody, say, in New Hampshire or Maine. You're going to get somebody who's invested in the success of the renewable energy project. Um, the idea here is that I'd like to leave you with tonight is that we in America don't make it easy for people without a lot of money to be good environmentalists. We make it very easy for the rich to do that. We can do things like put solar panels on our house or buy a Tesla. But if you don't have a lot of resources, even if you care a lot about the environment, we make it very, very hard for you to do anything about it. And you know, we see in this disparity of the effects of climate change it's going to be a lot harder for certain groups of people to adapt than it is for others. And what we need to do is empower these people to put their money where their mouth is and have a stake in the action here because this stuff's not going to get built right, right away. It's going to take a long time. We need to build it as fast as possible. We need to build as much of it as we can. And I think ideas like this are a great way for us to contribute to that solution.